Our first speaker this session is going to be Phil Walter, and the talk is about proposition this session. Tree housing compatibility checking, that's the way of saying we have two completely <laughs> disjoint things. <laughs> Can people hear me? Yes. Can people see me? Yes. So, the title of this talk is Propositions as Sessions. I'm Philip Wadler from the University of Edinburgh. Why am I wearing this shirt? Well, I wear this shirt, here it is larger. We as functional programmers know where we stand. We stand upon the foundations of lambda calculus. Now, one of the ways in which we know this is from the Curry-Howard isomorphism, which tells us that when you're using a simply typed lambda calculus, or a more complicatedly typed lambda calculus, that propositions of logic correspond to types, that proofs in that logic correspond to programs with those types, and that Normalization or simplification of proofs corresponds to evaluation or reduction of the corresponding programs. So we call it the correspondence. We sometimes call it the isomorphism. We have many names for it. Propositions as types being one of them. And it really is an isomorphism because the structure is preserved all the way down. It's not just the types that correspond to propositions. It's not just the programs that correspond to proofs, but even e reduction of programs corresponds to simplification of proofs. So there's a lot of structure there. And it's very nice that you have Getzen, in 1933, formulates intuition as natural deduction. Just a little later, Church formulates lambda calculus and then simply type lambda calculus. And all you need to do is wait 50 years. <laughs> and Howard publishes the paper saying, look, these are exactly the same thing. And one can see that they are exactly the same thing. And it's a very robust correspondent. It doesn't just work for one thing. It's not just that intuition and natural deduction corresponds to simply type lambda calculus, but also, right? Quantification over proposition, second order quantification, corresponds to polymorphism, which we use all the time. On the next step, right, we've heard a lot about dependent types. How were dependent types discovered? Because in this paper by Howard, he pointed out that quantification over individuals corresponds to dependent types. Um, and it works for many other things. So monads came along, monologues came along much earlier. Eventually somebody worked out, wait a minute, monads, monologue, one form of monologue exactly corresponds to monads. So that gives us things like state and exception. And even um, it's discovered that Gödel's embedding of classical logic into intuitionistic logic corresponds exactly to continuation passing stuff. So time and time again, this crops up. It's not just one correspondence, but many. It's very robust. It works for everything. You know what I'm going to say. There's one thing it hasn't worked for. right? We all walk around now with four processors in our laptops, with four processors in our pocket, in our phone, and that phone is talking to other processors other places. So concurrency and distribution are the most important thing we have to cope with. Oh, it's the one place that Curry Howard fails. My faith has been tried. <laughs> so, fortunately, recently there has been some work that suggests, no, we can do this, and propositions are now going to correspond to session types. Um, proofs correspond to processes, and cut elimination <coughs> is going to correspond to communication. Again, we have a very tight correspondence here. So let me explain this history to you. Right. Who 
recognizes this fellow? Yes? Johnny Girard. So this is Johnny Girard. And back in 1987, he published a paper on. Oh my God. Back in 1987, he published a paper on linear logic, and right from the start, everybody said, this is it. This is the logic that will correspond to concurrency. And he had the same idea himself. One of the logical operators of the logic was called par, or parallel. And indeed, in 1994, Samson Nebrevsky wrote a paper with the title, Proofs as Processes pointing out how to do this, and was then elaborated on a little bit later by Bell and Scott, who filled in all the details. Um, and what he did is he showed that you could take linear logic and translate it into process calculus in such a way that the simplifications in the linear logic corresponded to simplifications in the process calculus. Hooray! Well, wait a minute. I could take, um, right, linear logic is just a little bit more complicated than lambda calculus. I can take lambda calculus and translate that into pi calculus, say. That was the process calculus they used. And I can do that. I can embed that such that reductions in the um, lambda calculus correspond to reductions in the process calculus. And that's what they did. Linear logic embedded into process calculus such that the reductions correspond. But just because I did that, I wouldn't say, ah, this means lambda calculus is telling us about parallelism just because I can interpret it in pi calculus. So it was nice that this correspondence existed, but it wasn't, didn't really mean that linear logic was necessarily telling us about parallelism. Now at the same time, over here, Kohai Honda came up with session types. Session types are very easy. They are types for protocols. And the basic types are there's a type that says, um, output a value of type A and then behave as protocol B. There's another one that says input a value of type A and behave as protocol B. And these are dual, output and input. Um, he also had operators for offer a choice of two protocols, A or B, and select from a choice of two protocols, A or B. And in fact, the offering of a choice and selecting from a choice looks just like linear logic. And he used those symbols. So it was just like choice in linear logic. But the output and the input were different, and he wrote them differently. So some bits matched, but some bits didn't match. So Kohei Co 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 did this in 1993. There was a later paper filling it in. And this line here, between these two, um, lots and lots of work. A great deal of work on session typing, including multi-party session types and all sorts of interesting things. So lots of work here. And then Gideon Vasconcellos in 2010 published a particularly nice variant where they embedded the session calculus as type in a um, linear lambda calculus. So a nice functional programming language with subtyping and so on. So this would make it practical to use. That's not good. <laughs> That would make it practical for you session types in a functional language. Now, this line here, this one meant lots and lots of work. This line here means complete silence. Nothing happened. Until, in 2010, Keras and Fenning came up with a really interesting variant of Abramsky's original idea. I'll show you what this variant was in just a moment. And what I'm going to do in this paper is do some further improvements on their variant here, and then use that to explain Gain Vasconcellos' language over here. Because when Keras and Fenning came up with this, he said, look, it's session types. And you could look at it, and you would say, yes, that's session types. But that was all they did. They said, look, it's session types. They didn't actually do anything formal. So in this paper, we're going to do something formal, and we're going to show how this a slight variant of this language maps onto this language. Well, a slight variant of this language. So a variant of this one and a variant of this one. <coughs> so the key thing is the twist. And the twist was the change what Abramsky had done back in 94. So here were Abramsky's two rules 
for the connectives tensor and par. And what he does is he says, right, they're both kinds of pairing. And uh, what we're going to do for tensor is output a YZ pair along channel X. And for par, what we're going to do is input a YZ pair along channel X. Here was the clever twist that Keras and Fenning came up with. They said that, um, right, no, it's not a pair. What we're going to do is, so P is a process here with the channel Y of type A, and Q is a process with the channel X of type B, and we're going to combine them by saying along channel X, output a Y. So now the type of channel X is output in A, and then behave as B. So it's the session type for output. And similarly, if you read um, from X, you're going to read a Y and then behave as B. So read a Y type A and then behave as B. So it's a very slight twist on what Abramski did. And I'm going to change the notation just a little bit. So what this says is allocate a fresh channel name Y and then on X read a value and onto this channel Y. Um, that's all we're going to ever do, so I'll just give it a separate notation. And that just means the same thing. Along X read a fresh variable Y, so these both allocate fresh variables Y. So that's what Keras and Fenning did, only not quite. Instead of the two rules I just showed you, they had these four rules. And they had four rules because instead of using classical linear logic, they use intuitionistic linear logic. And what that means is that both tensor on the right and lollipop on the left, lollipop being defined in terms of par, correspond to output and Lollipop on the right and tensor on the left both correspond to input. So if you want to do output or input, you then have to decide is it on the left or the right, and that tells you which of these things it's encoded as. So as you can see, it's a bit complicated, and the idea is just to say, hey, look, let's just use the original classic linear logic, and it becomes much simpler. And by the way, you know, why didn't they seem to do this? Well, they do mention it as an aside in one of their papers that you could do this. But they say, oh, but this has better locality properties. But the locality property they describe is really weird. There is something called local pi calculus, which is great, and it's not what they thought. Um, so I'm not sure why really they're doing this. Also, Frank Fenning said, I think this will adapt to dependent types more easily. And maybe he's right. But I think just to get started, simpler is better. So I'm proposing, let's do it the simple way. And there are a couple of technical differences in the paper. I'm not going to go into all of them. If you're interested, I hope you'll read the paper. But um, the original formulation of Abramski was a little bit odd, because it said for the axiom, that's going to correspond to um, read on x and then write it out again on w. Um, and this only is going to work for a propositional variable, because we'll then know where it's going from x to w. Whereas, right, if we just do it for any type, well, a, that's written a perp, a perp perp is the same as a, so this has no direction at all. But if you do it this way, right, propositional value variables correspond to polymorphism, what you're doing, you're polymorphic, you substitute a type for the polymorphic variable. So we substitute, and we get something that's not an axiom anymore. So if we use something at a type, we have to change the program. That's not polymorphism as we know it. So if we want polymorphism as we know it, we need this as the axiom. And again, this was suggested in a paper by Paris and Fede, but they don't use that in their original paper. They just say, you might do it this way. I think we should do it this way, because then we get polymorphism. Um, Paris and Fede, in fact, had no axioms at all. Um, I will skip over that. You can look at the details of their paper to see why they do it that way. But I think that's weird. I think we want this axiom. Okay, so that's the main changes. And then here's the big thing, right? We've got traditionally the cut rule, 
the cut rule says P is a process. Um, we're going to read the cut rule and say, right, so the linear logic, you both know the color scheme, right? The bits in blue are traditional linear logic. The bits in red tell you how to add processes. Um, so this is the cut rule of linear logic in blue. And then we're going to say, well, P is a process that outputs an A on channel X. And Q is a process that's expecting an A per on channel X. Right, so whether this is output or input depends on A and A per. Right, but we want to cut, um, connect these two channels. So this is what we do here. And then there's lots written down about how you prove cut elimination, which says any cuts in your program can be replaced by smaller cuts. And you keep doing this so you get rid of all the cuts. And that corresponds to evaluating your program, and in particular, to communication along this channel. So there are many things you do with cut rules. One of the things you have to do is look at commuting conversion. I won't talk about those here, but they're in the paper. And again, the treatment of commuting conversions in the paper is a bit different than Keras and Fenning. They sort of use just the ones they want. I say, no, start with the logic. The logic has these commuting conversions. That's what we'll use. Um, so those will become our reduction relation for our process calculus. But what you always get in proofs of cut elimination is principal cuts cuts of an operator against its dual. So here's a cut of A tensor B <coughs> against A per par B per. So this is doing an output. This is doing an input. And what does it do? We'll just um, right, say, right, so um, we're reading on Y. So Y communicates directly. So um, that's the cut here. And similarly, we'll just um, Sorry, but this is the cut on Y. Right, so we've got a new Y there. Right, so we're introducing a fresh X of type A there. Um, so here's the cut on X. So first we cut on Y to do that communication, then we cut on X to do that. It can actually happen in either order. There's a rule that says that these two things are equivalent. So that's it. The traditional uh, part of the proof of cut elimination tells us precisely how inputs and outputs match up in exactly the way you'd expect them to match up. And notice that the typing is telling us something interesting. It's saying, when you're doing um, an output here, right, you've got separate P and Q. The only communication between them is here, unless gamma and delta share things, which they're allowed to do if you uh, use the um, exponential type of linear logic. Uh, but basically, these are independent. And that's why when they talk to one R, you're guaranteed not to have deadlock. So it's a restriction. So what's in the paper? First thing in the paper is this calculus CP, which is classical processes, also stands perhaps for something else. <laughs> um, and you get two theorems, right? The exact ones you'd expect, that if P has type gamma and P reduces to Q, then Q has type gamma. And more importantly, if P has type gamma, then there is a Q, such that P reduces to Q, and Q is not a cut. And what do those mean? It means you can always reduce no deadlock. Notice deadlock can be interesting, right? We need the thing that's like the Y combinator that gives you back deadlock, but this is the starting point. No deadlock. Just as in simply typed lambda calculus, everything terminates. And then the second thing is called good variation, which is a variation of the gay Vasconcellus calculus. And I give a translation. Here's a little part of it. Um, so these are the various contexts. So here is um, function app, linear function application. Here's sending along a channel. Interestingly, both of these things translate as uh, the par operator. And so they both translate as doing an output. And the fact that you can do the translation, I think, gives us a lot of confidence that CP is something reasonable. Um, to change, I had to change GV a bit because we get this theorem, right? And the theorem says, right, so if M is a well-typed term in um, the gate and Vasconcellus in GV, then its translation is well-typed in CP, which is what you'd expect. But this tells you, of course, that you can reduce these things and they won't deadlock. So the original gay basket tells can deadlock. I had to make a variant of it because this variant doesn't deadlock. That's what's called 
the good variation. Last thing in the paper, color. You'll notice I used color very carefully in all the proofs. Don't read the paper in the proceedings. It's in black and white. Download it from the web. It's in color. Okay. So, in conclusion, let's go back where we started. We can go back to where we began, except you see <laughs> that our foundations for Latin calculus have magically become foundations for process calculus. Thank you very much.